Get out your Bible. Open it to Isaiah chapter 54. Isaiah 54. So good morning, everybody. Welcome back from the break. Uh, some of you are out of town, so I'm glad to see everyone back, and, and hopefully you're thriving, doing well. But if you're not, come on, every day that goes by is a day for things to improve. Every moment that happens is a, is a moment for something to get better. Sometimes we fall, find ourselves in a difficult situation, but we don't have to stay there. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for the hour with thee. I'm walking through the valley. I'm walking through it. And so my intention is not to sit down and camp in the valley of the shadow, and yours should not be that intent either. You should desire to move on, move through, move beyond the circumstances and challenges of life. And they happen to all of us. They happen to all of us. So Isaiah chapter 54, we'll get there in a moment. But to t the title of today's message is Prepare for More in 2024. Prepare for More in 2024. And preparation, I'm going to emphasize in part of the, net, the, part of the message. Preparation is essential. It is necessary. We can expect all we want, but there are certain things we need to do in order to prepare to receive the blessings of God. My charge to you, my challenge to you is to live purposefully this year, to live intentionally this year, to live, uh, make every moment count, make every day count. Not just wake up in the morning, just whatever happens, happens. However the day plays out is the way it's going to play out. You have every opportunity to determine what your day is going to be like, and it starts in the morning when you rise. You decide when you put your feet on the floor before you ever get out of bed uh, what your attitude is going to be for that day. We all do. We can have that bad attitude. Oh, my gosh, I didn't get enough. This is horrible. I hate my job. I feel like I sound like Roz from Monster Sync on that one. Uh, <laughs> um, but, I, but I hate my job. This is horrible. What day is it? It's only Monday. Oh, you ever have those moments? You ever have those moments where you were so excited, you woke up, it's Friday, and then you realized a little later it was only Thursday? <laughs> You're like, oh. But I don't, I don't know why we live for Friday except that there's a rest or a break in the action. But the truth is every day we should face the same and not be looking, if I could just get to this point, if I could just get past this day, if I'm always looking for, man, I, just, I can't, wait, can't wait till the school year ends. Man, that's five months away. If I'm a student, I just can't wait. I, can't, I hear young people all the time, I can't wait to get out of here. You're only in ninth grade. <laughs> I can't wait to get out of school. And I appreciate that. Don't get me wrong. It's not like when I was a kid in school, I'm thinking, oh, this is great. <laughs> I, I appreciate the education I received, but... Um, now, I'm a, now, again, I'm, I'm, when I talk sometimes, I'm talking as a, an adult with a different mindset now. And my mindset is this. If I had gone back as a, as a, and, and relived my youth in some ways, I think I would have the mindset of, you know what? Between January and the end of May when school gets out, there's a lot of living to do. So rather than having to, I just can't wait to get out of here. How about what does God have for me in the next five months of my life? When I am liberated from this thing called public education, what does God have for me? Because if all we're doing is looking for the weekend, all we're doing is looking for the end of a season, we're missing out on things that God wants to do in us in this time, in this moment. Imagine if Joseph in the Old Testament had the attitude I just can't wait till I'm out of this prison. I just can't wait to, because he was a captive. For years and years and years and years. But he honored God daily and he looked for opportunity to glorify God through what he'd said and what he did. And God used him even in the season of being a servant to somebody else. And I think sometimes we're looking for liberation and not realizing God wants to use us where we are. God wants to use us even in those seasons where it doesn't seem like he's with us. So again, live intentionally, live purposefully this year. I believe there is more in store in 2024. I try not to use those kind of rhymes because it becomes cliche in a lot of places, but this is what I believe God placed in my heart. And I was talking to Debbie and she almost had the exact same thing. So I said, I'm going with this. Prepare for more in 2024. 
Isaiah chapter 54, beginning in verse number 1. I'm reading from the Passion Translation. It says, Rejoice with singing, you barren one. You who have never given birth, burst, burst into song, or burst into a song, of joy, a song of joy and shout. You who have never been in labor, for the deserted wife will have more children than the married one, says the Lord. Increase is coming. Say, increase is coming. So enlarge your tent and add extensions to your dwelling. Hold nothing back. Make the tent ropes longer and the pegs stronger. You will increase and spread out in every direction. Your sons and daughters will conquer nations and revitalize desolate cities. Do not fear, for your shame is no more. Do not be embarrassed, for you will not be disgraced. You will forget the inadequacy you felt in your youth, and you will no longer remember the shame of your widowhood. Now, this is God speaking to the nation of Israel. The nation of Israel has been unfaithful, had been unfaithful to God. And God is calling them back. And God is telling them what he is going to do. God is telling them that they need to prepare for more. They need to get ready because God's blessings are about to be poured out. And they are about to be poured out in abundance. We might say good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. This is what God has for those who are his children. So we need to prepare for more this year. So I understand this text is writing to the nation of Israel, but I want to glean from this some things we can apply to our own lives for this coming year. One thing in verse number one says, rejoice with singing, burst into a song of joy and shout. Number one, you need to put your praise on repeat. You need to put your praise on repeat. I'm not talking about your music. Letting somebody else praise for you through your device is not praising God. Praising God is opening your own mouth. Praising God is dancing yourself. Praising God is raising your own hands, not watching other people do it. If you're a concert goer, I have no, I'm not, not opposed to concerts at all. And if you get up in there and you know you just let it go, and you know, you, you're just screaming and shouting, ah! <laughs> any Swifties in the house? No? Nobody's going to claim that? Okay, so uh, if, 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 if that's your thing, if that's your thing, wonderful. But come on, let's begin to get our praise on and begin to worship God and glorify him for who he is. If we can, if we can cheer at a game, if we can throw our popcorn all over watching television, if we can jump up and down at a concert, if we can scream at our favorite star or artist, then how much more does God deserve our praise? And so in this verse, God is telling the people, rejoice, burst forth, burst forth, burst forth with song. And so I would suggest to you in 2024, one thing that you need to do, one thing that I need to do is begin your day with a song. Begin your day with praise. Now, praise is not necessarily singing, incidentally. Praise is just glorifying God for who he is. When you wake up in the morning, it could be as simple as, Lord, I'm just so grateful to you. I'm so thankful that. And then you attach that thing you're grateful for. I know some families who have traditions at Thanksgiving time where they go around the table and each family member has to say at least one thing for which they're thankful I love that tradition because it focuses our attention on why we're eating all this food today. But what if daily we got up and said, Lord. In fact, we sang a song a little while ago, 10,000 reasons for my heart to sing, right? 10,000 reasons for my heart to find. 10,000. And I think if we just started with, the, with just finding one. Now, some of you probably have a practice already of just praising God when you get up. Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. You get out of bed, you fall on the floor. Lord, I'm just thankful. I'm grateful that you are the Lord of all creation, that you are still enthroned in heaven, that you are still ruler of all and in control of all. I'm grateful to you that you've caused me to be healthy and caused me to be able to get up and go to school, get up and go to work. I'm thanking you, Lord, that I have a job and I can make money 
so I can pay bills. I can purchase food. I can buy gas for my car. Many years ago, I was in a church service. This is many years ago. And at that period of history, this wasn't recent, that period of history, uh, gas prices were rising rapidly. They were, they were climbing quickly. And so the pastor said, how many of you, how many of you are thankful when you go to the gas pump and see those gas prices? And I, without thinking, raised my hand. And the pastor looked at me and said, yeah, of course you would be. Now, I didn't know what to think about the comment, but the reason I raised my hand, I wasn't looking for attention. I, did, I, I forgot it was a rhetorical question. I shouldn't even be answering it at all. But in my heart, I was like, I raised my hand because, no, I'm, I'm not happy that the gas prices are rising. I'm not happy that food prices are climbing. I'm not happy that insurance prices are out of control. I'm not happy that if I need to see a doctor, they're going to tell me, well, we have to go through this big process in maybe two, three months before we can see you. And maybe it'll get better by then anyway. What if I get worse, Doc? Well, we can't see you for two or three months. I'm not happy about any of these things. But happiness and thankfulness are two different things. So my thankfulness was not for the fact that gas prices were rising. My thankfulness was for the fact that I have a God in heaven whose resources are unlimited, who has said he would care for me all the days of my life, who has said he would provide for me. I'm not thankful for the gas prices going up. I'm thankful that God will provide for me. So I wake up in the morning, I have a song of praise in my heart. I have a song of praise on my lips. I sing in the shower. I, I really do, actually. Uh, the showering, after I read my Bible, showering is the very first thing I do in the morning. And uh, I have, for, for as long as I can remember, I was showered in the morning. But I sing in the shower. I don't sing for the whole world to hear. It's pretty low, actually. But I'm singing, and it's just my heart opening up. It's just my heart singing to God. Sometimes a song I know, and sometimes a song that I, that's just happening at the moment. There's words that come into my mouth or in my heart, and I just, I just let them out. You know, I used to uh, know a man many years ago. This is over 30 years ago now, and his name was Wayne Applewhite. And uh, he just had a simple song, and he always, this man had a smile on his face every day. I mean, every day. Wayne, what's up? Just smiling ear to ear. But he had a song, and I, after all these years, it's been over 30 years, I've never forgotten it. But praise him in the morning, praise him in the evening, praise him when the sun no longer shines. Praise him on the mountains, praise him in the valley, everybody praise him all the time. It was, it was a simple song, and I never forgot it because it, it, because it is so simple. And it says exactly what needs to be said at times. Praise him. David had to tell himself, praise the Lord, O my soul. And all that is within me, praise his holy name. Come on. If we are going to prepare for more in 2024, we need to start our day with praise. We need to find an opportunity to praise in the middle of the day. We need to find an opportunity to praise at the end of the day. I understand things are happening. I understand that there are difficulties that you experienced on some days, some things you didn't foresee and they happen, and some of those things are, are crushing, some of those things are devastating, and we're not praising God for the effects of that thing. We're praising God because he's with us, praising God because he's still on the throne. We're praising God because through it all, he's going to bring me to victory. But I have to keep my heart and my mind, my attitude in the right place. It can't be a free-for-all. My mind is running all over the place, bouncing off the walls and doing whatever it wants to do. You ever have those moments where your mind is just, just running crazy and you're trying to put it in a headlock and say, stop? <laughs> but I've discovered that one thing that we need to do to replace these, these, these crazy thoughts that are racing all over is not to tell them to stop. Because when you're telling your, those things to stop, they just keep going. That your focus is all on that. What you need to do is replace the thought with other thoughts. And how do you get those other thoughts? You get in the Word of God. That's how you do it. But we need to begin our day with praise. Praise God's holy name forevermore. The attitude of your heart is more important than the words you speak. When you're praising God, it's the attitude of your heart that is more important than the words you speak. 
What I'm going to say next is not intended to impress you. I'm trying to make a point here. I have two degrees. I'm highly educated. But I've discovered that my education in the face of God is unimpressive. Paul, the apostle in Scripture, begins to list all his accomplishments. Like this guy was amazing. And then he goes on to make this statement. I counted all his trash as rubbish. It's meaningless. But what I have is a heart that loves God and lips with which I can praise him. And the sound of that is unimportant. The Bible talks about a joyful noise. Let's emphasize the word noise on that. Because maybe all you have is a noise. But if it's joyful, come on, God hears it. And God receives it. Let's praise him every day. And so, again, to experience more and more in 2024, we need to put our praise on repeat. You need to change your playlist from griping and complaining. You need to change your playlist from griping and complaining to worshiping and praising. My father would always, uh, or not always, but frequently say that to us as children. All you kids do is gripe, moan, and groan. I can still hear that to this day. <laughs> All you kids do is gripe, moan, and groan. Man, your, your parent ever have, feel like your children are that way? And what about God? Man, all you ever do is gripe, moan, and groan. And all I'm looking for you to do is say, Father, in spite of A, B, and C, I'm going to praise you. In spite of X, Y, and Z, I'm going to raise my hands, I'm going to lift my voice, and I'm going to adore you and recognize you for the great Father that you are. Number two, the second thing we need to do in 2024 to prepare for more is enlarge our dwelling. We need to enlarge our dwelling. In verse 2, it said, increase is coming, so enlarge your tent. Add a, extensions to your dwelling and hold nothing back. So preparing for more means we need to create a larger space in order to receive what God has for us. I'm reminded of the woman who, whose husband had died and Elisha had come to her. And she's speaking to Elisha and said, you know, what am I going to do? The, the creditors are coming. I've got nothing left. They're going to take my sons to pay the debts that we owe. And Elisha said, what can I do? What do you have? He asked the woman what she had. And you might remember she said, I have, I have this little jar of oil. I have a little jar of oil. And so Elisha said to her, here's what I want you to do. I want you to go around the neighborhood, get as many containers as you can, bowls, cups, jars, bottles, whatever it takes, you get as many as you can. And so he says to her, once you gather all that stuff together, take the jar of oil you have and begin to pour it in the containers. This is, a, this is an e pluribus unum moment. From one, many. She had one jar of oil that was limited in its contents. It was finite. And she begins to pour. And as she pours, every container, every jar, every bottle, every bowl is filled to the brim. Every one of them. God miraculously multiplies the oil she has into an abundance. And he, Elisha tells her, now you get some for yourself, for you and your boys, and sell the rest to live on. Now this is related to the idea that we need to enlarge our dwelling. Listen, get prepared to receive God's blessings. The King James says it to her this way, get some jars together, get some containers, and gather not a few. Don't get a few. Get a bunch. Get as many as you can. And so it should be evident that the amount of oil the woman received was related to the number of containers she had. And it should be obvious to you as well that if she had more containers, the oil would have continued to flow. Let me say that again. If she had gathered more containers, if she had been able to prepare to receive more, there would have been more. 
And God is telling us to enlarge our dwellings. To prepare for more in 2024, we need to get containers ready. We need to do things God's way. The only limitations on her receiving or the only limitation on her uh, the oil and it, and it stopping to flow was the number of containers she had. So we need not limit God's supply by maintaining a narrow view of his power and provision. If we have a limited view of God, then that limited view is going to put us in a position where we don't prepare too much. We don't get ready for the more. If your God is only this big, you're going to prepare in proportion to that. If you see God is unable to provide anything to you or much to you, you're going to prepare that way. And the Bible says that God is able to do exceedingly abundantly. Not just abundantly, exceedingly abundantly, hyper abundantly. And so to receive what he has, we have to prepare for that. And that means we have to get ready and we have to get our containers ready. So sometimes God's provision in our life is limited by our own thinking. Sometimes God's provision in our life is limited by our own thinking. So what does that mean? Change the way you think. Change the way you think. So God used a single jar of oil multiplied it miraculously for this woman and put her in a position to have abundance for the foreseeable future. We want more in 2024, so we need to prepare. We need to enlarge our dwelling. Notice also that the woman gave the prophet something to work with. What do you have was his question. Her response was actually nothing except I have nothing except a jar of oil. The question for us then is, what are we offering God? What are we giving him to work with? When the offering plate goes by, do you have a penny that you can drop in? Well, I don't have much. Do you have a penny? Do you have a dime? Every plant grows from a single seed. And even if you have only a single seed, it's going to produce something. So give God something to work with. In the same way the prophet said, what do you have? And so God, I believe, would be asking us, what do you have? Let's move away from money to say, what, what talent or ability do you have? Listen, God gifts people. He gifts them. He gives them abilities for kingdom purposes. What is it that God has placed in you? Some of you are like, I don't know. Oh, he's, he's put something on the inside of you. Some of you, this, some of you might just have this gift of, of hospitality. Not everybody has that. Have you ever noticed that? I don't know that it's a gift of mine to be hospitable. I'm pretty sure it's not. <laughs> But God's given different people different gifts. There's gifts of administration. What does that mean? People can help organize. Now, just naturally speaking, some of you have natural skills that would benefit the kingdom. Are you offering those out for God? Say, hey, here's what I have. This is what I have. So we're talking about enlarging our dwellings. We're talking about giving God something to work with. What talent are you willing to give what treasure are you willing to provide? And what about your time? We have a children's ministry that can always use more laborers. But I don't want to put people in the children's ministry just to be in there and say, I've got this many people. I want people who love children. In youth ministry, sometimes people ask me, what are you looking for in a youth minister? Somebody who loves teenagers. Here's, here's how it goes for me. Love God, love teenagers. Well, they love God. Do they love teenagers? No, I don't want them. They've got to love teenagers. What about the children's department? Love God, love children. My daughter's an elementary school teacher. I've been a high school teacher for many years of my life. 
My daughter, when she started out teaching, Dad, I don't know how you can put up with those high school kids. They're just so ridiculous. They're rude. They're obnoxious. To which I would say to her, I don't know how you put up with the little ones. Teach her, teach her, teach her, teach her, teach her. <laughs> don't touch me. Don't touch me, kid. <clears throat> I mean, I know how to navigate teenage life, and not, not as a teenager, but I know how to navigate it as an adult, but I don't know how to deal with little ones. They're just different. And so God has gifted her. She has that gift with young children. She's good. Not because she's my daughter. God has gifted her, and she's good. And so I'm looking for people. So, again, we're talking about, man, what has God imparted to you? What gift has he placed in you that that would benefit the kingdom of God, more specifically, that would benefit Church United Naples. If you're part of the family, we're looking for you to contribute to the needs of the family. And I'm not going to look up right now because he's taking names. I'm not taking names. I'm just trying to encourage you here. And so God wants us to enlarge our dwellings. Notice that the woman's increase was proportional to the preparation she had made. I would suggest to you that our increase in 2024 is going to be proportional to the preparations we make to receive the increase. And then third, the third thing we need to do is strengthen our foundation. Strengthen the foundation. In verse 2 it said, make the tent ropes longer and the pegs stronger. Make the tent ropes longer and the pegs stronger. Ropes and stakes give the tent stability. Longer ropes uh, tend to lead to a greater capacity. So we're talking about enlarging our dwelling and securing the foundation. Longer ropes and make sure those pegs are in tight, that this tent is secure. You remember that Jesus said, listen, my followers, those who truly follow me, they've dug deep and they've established their foundation on bedrock. Their foundation is sure. True followers of mine are stable. He went on to say that, listen, the storms of life are going to come. They happen to everybody. He didn't say, listen, if you found your life on, uh, put, your, put your life on the foundation of me, there's never going to be a problem again. That's a gospel that's not, that's not, that's an inaccurate gospel. That's not a real gospel. Find Jesus and never have a problem. No. Find Jesus and have a solution to every one of your problems. That's true. But it doesn't say you'll never have a problem. So, he said if, my true followers, man, they dig down deep. They get to the rock, and they begin to build their house, their lives on that rock. And when the storms of life come, and they surely will, when the violent storms beat against their house, when their lives experience upheaval, they are not shaken. The houses do not fall. We're talking about experiencing more and, pre and preparing for more in 2024. We now, more than ever, need a sure foundation. We all need a sure foundation. One way to do that is to have your life established on the Word of God. Pastor and Rob and I never shy away from the fact that we have one foundation for you in that Scripture. That's the Bible. It's the Word of God. It's accurate. It's infallible. It is infinite. It's not going to lead us astray. The Word of God is for all people, in all places, in all times. There are some who would tell us that 2024, 2023, 2022, 2000, the Word of God has no place in anybody's we're, we're too modern now. We've, we've, we've progressed too far. We've advanced as human beings. We don't need this idea of God anymore. And yet the Word of God, because God is eternal, He is outside the bounds of time, and He laughs at man's arrogance. 
His word is for all people in all times, in all places. It's for you and it's for me. It's something on which we need to build our lives. You need to get into the word of God and read it. We've told you this time and again. And thus some of you have taken up that as a challenge and you've begun to read the word of God. Others of you hear us and then go your way and never engage God through his word. I want to tell you this and I want to emphasize this. The primary way, the prime, not the only way, but the primary way that God speaks to us is through his word, his written word. Many years ago, my mother, I believe it was, sent me some letters that I guess my father had written her, like before I was born or around the time I was born, which was a long time ago. And I'm reading, I'm reading some of the letters, and my, my father is telling my mother his intention that I am I'm going to school here, and I really don't like being away from home, but I'm going to do this so that I can get a better job, so I can take care of you and the family. I love you, and I want to do these things. And perhaps you have letters that you've kept from those who have written them to you, those letters meaning so much to you, and you read them from time to time to remind you of this perhaps love affair that somebody has with you the right kind of love affair. And so God in his written word, he's talking to us and there's a love affair going on. Yeah, there are parts of this that are dry. There absolutely are. But there are other places you can get in here and you discover that the love of God is, is a crazy kind of love. It really is. And you begin to see the love that God has for each one of us. And so the word of God is the primary way that God speaks to us is through his word. So get into the word. Read it, meditate on it, practice it. And so in January, let's see, today is the 7th. So to go for three weeks from now, it would be 21 more days. And there are 21 books or 21 chapters in the book of John. And so my challenge to you is before the end of January is to read the entire book of John. What book? The book of John. And as you read through the book of John, I would challenge you to highlight things in your Bible. Now, you say, well, I use my phone, I have an app. Well, the app I use, I can highlight on it, even on my phone. If you write stuff, if you have a written document, then write in your Bible. I can't write in your Bible. Highlight, write, and then while you are reading through Scripture, expect the Spirit of God to speak to you because God speaks through His Word, and the Spirit of God will illuminate the Word of God to you. And I'm telling you, you need to write down one or two thoughts that you got from that set of verses on that day. This is what it says. I believe this is what the Spirit of God was telling me here. Because the, and the Word of God written is for all of us, but then the Spirit of God will illuminate things that you need right now or things that were going to help shore up your foundation. You need to strengthen your foundation. So dig deep. Ask the Holy Spirit for revelation. Take notes. Record what the Holy Spirit is saying to you. Number two, we need to be attuned to the Holy Spirit in these last days. More than ever, you need to have the Word of God inside of you. You need to have the, the Holy Spirit's voice clearly speaking and you hearing and receiving. Jesus said, my sheep know my voice. And so I cling to that. Jesus, you said that your sheep know your voice. I'm one of your sheep. I know your voice. I don't, I don't know what he sounds like. I know his voice. And Jesus went on saying, the voice of a stranger they will not follow. The more that you hang around somebody, the more familiar you become with their voice. People in my family know my voice. Why? Because they're around me all the time. They know what kind of inflections I have. They know how deep it is or how not deep it is. If it goes really deep, they usually get scared because they say I'm angry in those moments. But they know. They know. And in the same way that they know my voice, I can know God's voice and so can you by spending time with him and getting into his word and knowing his voice. So what does that mean as far as strengthening your foundation? 
It means that every day you need to spend time in prayer. Don't make prayer some kind of major, oh, great God in heaven, I bow my knee to you now. That's foolishness. Just talk to God. It's a chat. It's a conversation. Now, because it's a conversation, it's not a monologue. Although some of us probably approach prayer as a monologue. No, pray. You can make petitions, which means asking God for things. I would highly recommend you do this. Start out with praise. Then maybe throw out some petitions. If you have some questions, ask them. And then remain silent. Don't get up from prayer and leave. Remain silent. Say, Lord, speak. And listen. Now, if you expect to hear an audible voice, you may, but I doubt it. It's not that God can't speak audibly for us to hear, but that's not usually the method. God speaks to us through our spirit, through, from his spirit to our spirit. And there's something that we just know, and I've said this many times, I can't explain it to you, I just know. <laughs> I just know that was the spirit of God. So, stand to your feet for a moment. Stand to your feet, we're almost done. You're, you're falling asleep on me here. They killed the lights. I don't know why. They're all out. But uh, um, here's what I need you to do. We're going to declare some things. And your declaration actually means nothing. Because to me, this is like a, a um, New Year's, Eve, New Year's revolution, resolution. And I've never made New Year's resolutions. I get ask every year, Are you, what's your resolution? I don't have any. Why? Because they're usually just stuff we just say really flippantly and don't expect to live by them. So maybe we should have a New Year's revolution and decide this is what we're going to do. So we're going to declare some things, and we're going to declare with our own mouth, and I hope that you actually say, you know what, I'm going to make some faith. This, this is what I'm going to do. So repeat after me. I will elevate my expectation in 2024. I will receive greater revelation in 2024. I will see more breakthroughs. I will experience more healings. I will experience increased provision. I will go on the offensive in 2024. I will advance. I will advance. I will advance. I will advance. Come on, church, what are you doing? Are you going to advance or not? I'm going to advance. I will advance. I'm going to take territory. I will boldly go where the Holy Spirit leads me. I will be victorious. I will be victorious. I will be victorious. Come on, this is a new year. And you need to understand that your declaration, again, if you mix faith with it, things are going to start happening. Shore up your foundation. Strengthen your foundation. Enlarge your dwelling place. And prepare to receive the more that God has for us in 2024. But you need to recognize also the devil's not going to sit by and let you just happily go about the will of God. The more of a threat you become to the kingdom, the more he's going to operate in defensive mode. Because we're going on offense... He's going to play defense. Paul said many times, I wanted to come to you, but, I, but Satan hindered me. Notice he didn't say stopped, however. He said he got in the way. He was an obstacle. Now, I tell young people time and time again, listen, if you're in this position, your goal is outside that door, and there's an obstacle placed in your way, you need to figure out how to go over, under, around, or through that obstacle to get to your goal. Over, under, around, or through. And if your desire is to serve in the kingdom of God, if your desire is to press into the things of God, to know him more, you need to go around, go over, under, around every, through, uh, uh, every obstacle the devil places in your way. Every obstacle. He is not going to sit back and say, go ahead. Fulfill the plan of God for your life. His kingdom is under siege. It's under threat. It's under threat by us. And the kingdom of God is under, uh, under threat by the kingdom of darkness. Satan is doing all he can to stop the move of God. Just got a news report uh, this morning that uh, it's some, some place in, I believe it's Uganda, that they're going about killing all Christians and accusing them of having some kind of influence on certain things in the world. The days are getting darker, people. This whole big thing about uh, uh, this casual Christianity, it's no more. 
It is no more. This is a war. It's a genuine war. It's a real war. Go to Israel and ask them about it. That's real. It's a real flesh and blood war. We're fighting a real spiritual battle. And that spiritual battle bleeds out into the, the natural world. And so this is a war. It's a war that we need to be determined to win. We need to realize that with God on our side, we are always a majority. With God on our side, we are destined to win. But that we can't sit back and just wait for things to happen. We can't just sit back and say, okay, God, you're, you know, you're just going to do it all, and I'll just sit here and watch. Remember David. David didn't stand on one side of the valley and say, well, there's that big giant. I guess God's going to fight my battle for me. The Bible said that David got his stones, he got his sling, and he took off running to engage the enemy. David wasn't fearful. David wasn't scared. The, the, the giant was foreboding. The giant was immense. The giant was powerful. But David said, this guy is no match for my God. And so he met him out in the field of battle, swung his sling, whop, launched a stone, and down that giant fell. This wasn't a natural battle. There was a natural thing going on, but there's a spiritual side to it. And that's a God had empowered David to be victorious on the battlefield. And God has empowered you and me to be victorious on this battlefield. God has empowered us to go into 24 and be victorious, not to be victims, not to sit on the sideline, not to be an injured reserve, but to move and move and move and move, to go forth and advance, to take territory, to be victorious, to glorify God in all we say and do. 2024, prepare, prepare for more in 2024. Enlarge your tent, strengthen your foundation, and come on, put your praise on repeat. Put your praise on repeat. Put your praise on repeat. I don't like to praise him. Well, I don't know then how that works out with your Christianity. It's like telling, it's like you saying to me, you know, uh, do you ever tell your wife I love her? All the time. Well, why? You've been married a long time. Because, number one, I say it because it's real to me, and number two, I want it to be real to her. <laughs> I want her to know, I love you. So I say to God, hey, God, I love you. And that's why we get our praise on. It also keeps our mind focused that God is able, well able to bring us through every battle, every circumstance, every difficulty, every trial. And you're going to face trial, and you're going to face trouble, you're going to face difficulty. I never whitewashed that. Jesus said, look, in the world you're going to have trouble. You're going to have trouble. Follow me. But he said this. He said, you're going to have trouble, but be a good cheer. I've overcome the world. Listen, I've got this. Stay with me because we're going to get over this thing. You and me together, Jesus talking, you and me together, we're going to get through this. In fact, we're not going to get through it. We're going to get over it. We're going to be on top. We're going to plant that flag. Boom, victorious. Victorious. And you're going to bow your knee. You're going to glorify me. Why? Because I am worthy of praise, right? Jesus is worthy of all praise, glory, honor, might, majesty, magnificence. It's all his. God shares his glory with no one. 